Hey everybody, it's Lon Seib, and I've been getting in a lot of these mini PCs lately, all from the same company. We looked at a bunch from Ace Magician, and they also have another sub-brand here called Camruai, and that's what we've got here on the desk today. As you can see here on its case, it says gaming, and this is what they say is a gaming-focused mini PC, and it's got a pretty powerful Ryzen 7735HS processor inside. And what we're going to do in this video is take a closer look at this mini PC and see if it can play games along with some other stuff. And we'll be getting to that in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from the manufacturer. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. No one is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this mini PC is all about. Now the price point on this comes in at around $500, give or take. Sometimes there are some promotions that bring the price point down. For the price, I think it's very well equipped. You got that Ryzen 7735HS processor. It's running at a 45 watt TDP. It has 32 gigabytes of DDR5 RAM and 512 gigabytes of NVMe storage. It is a 3.0 NVMe drive inside. As you just saw me do here, you can pull the panel off very easily to do some upgrades. You can swap out the NVMe if you want. You can also swap the RAM out. You can bring this up to 64 gigabytes if you want, and you got to buy those in pairs, so two 32 gigabyte RAM modules. This one came with a data RAM, so it looks like it's got some name brand stuff at least. And then you'll also see here that there is an additional SATA storage area, so you could slide in a two and a half inch notebook hard drive, either a solid state drive or a spinning one and add some additional storage or add some dual booting options to your PC here. And it's very easy to get in here and make those upgrades. Now it's got a good number of ports on board, but unfortunately it's USB-C port here is not a full speed USB 4 port. The documentation says that it is running at 20 gigabit speed. However, I could not find anything digging through my diagnostic apps that leads me to think it's anything more than USB 3.1 Gen 2, but it does do video output, but you can't plug in an external GPU to increase its graphical performance, so just keep that in mind. You have two USB 3 ports here along with an audio jack. On the other side here, you've got two more USB 3 ports. You then have two HDMI outputs, so in addition to the USB-C port on the front, you can get two additional 4K60 displays going out the back for a total of three. And then over here is another mix-up in their promotional materials, but this time in favor of the customer. So on their website and on the Amazon page, they say that this is only gigabit Ethernet, but it is in fact two and a half gigabit Ethernet. It's a Realtek controller on board. Now it also, of course, has Bluetooth and Wi-Fi built in. The Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi 6, but not 6E. Let's boot this thing up now and see how it performs. All right, so it's all booted up now and it does come with a clean licensed copy of Windows 11 Pro that fully activated when I booted everything up. I did wanna show you a couple of things here on the top of the case. You'll note there's some RGB lighting. Out of the box, you can't turn the lighting off and they do have some software to adjust it, but it's not on their website yet. So hopefully that gets up there soon, especially if you wanna turn the lights off at night. You do have a indicator on the front here for the power switch as well. Now you'll note that this uh, switch here is a rocker. You've got performance, auto, and silent. And what this does is marginally adjusts the fan noise, but it also reduces the performance of the computer. So for the best performance, you wanna leave it on performance, but if the fan is getting too annoying, you can turn things down a bit and have it run at a slower rate of speed, which generates less heat. Uh, the fan does come on, but it's not as loud in this mode as it is in the performance mode here. But we'll leave it in the higher mode here for the purposes of seeing what this thing is capable of. The fan noise on this is not overly loud. It feels like it's got a pretty large fan on board, but it does kick on a lot, even if you're just browsing the web or doing some lower end activities. So just be aware of the fact that this thing is not silent and it will be running its fan constantly throughout your workday and when you're pushing it hard with games and whatnot. So let's take a look and see how it handles some basic tasks here and then we'll ramp it up. We'll start off with some web browsing. I'm gonna load up the uh, Brave browser here and go to the nasa.gov homepage. As you can see, everything just springs to life here. It is super responsive and fast, which is what I would expect 
out of a current generation Ryzen processor with this much RAM on board. So things really spring up very quickly here. There isn't much delay in doing anything, which is what you should expect out of this class of hardware. So on the basic side here, all is good. I did see some dropped frames when I was running 4K 60 frames per second videos from my YouTube channel. Not a lot, but a couple of areas where you'll see a little bit of a drop off like there. Not anything that I noticed, but certainly something that I haven't seen on some other Ryzen processor based devices we have looked at recently. And I suspect that maybe there's some driver updates that have to come down to improve some of that basic video decoding performance. But it wasn't something that impeded my ability to watch the video or anything that I really noticed, but it's just something we're seeing in the tests that we do. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 310, which puts this machine pretty much in line with other current generation Intel and AMD processors. Let's take a look now at some video editing. So this is DaVinci Resolve running with a 4K60 video project. One thing I noticed is that my cross dissolve here is stuttering a little bit when I am previewing the effect. That's something that might be due to some of those video issues we saw with the YouTube video earlier. I also installed vMix, which is the software that I use to run this channel. All the video that I produce, both recorded and live, goes through vMix on a pretty beefy gaming PC that I have here with a 2080 Ti GPU. I installed it here on the uh, little camera eye box. And if you're doing a 1080p project, it can get by provided vMix is the only thing running. vMix is not really designed to run on integrated graphics like this, but it's able to actually keep up and do some pretty cool compositing here without any noticeable drop frames. But you gotta kinda keep this thing front and center. During a live stream, I did try to do some 4K on it. That was a little too much. But I think if you're doing OBS and some basic 1080p streams, this might be adequate for that. Uh, but just don't expect a lot out of this for real-time video production. Now, games are where this device really shines. And what you're looking at here is Red Dead Redemption 2. Pretty demanding game, running at 1080p at the lowest settings. And it was largely staying at or above 40 frames per second in my testing, which is great for integrated graphics. So I think a lot of the current AAA titles will play pretty well on this, provided you keep your settings and your resolution in check. And if you go down to 720p on a lot of these games, it runs even better. I also ran No Man's Sky here at the standard settings, 1080p. Uh, this one was running at about 45 to 55 frames per second when you're on the planet. It would vary a bit with this game just because it's one of these procedurally generated things and every environment is different, but it was very, very playable. It's not up to the 60 frames per second you'd get on a more powerful PC, but again, we're running with a pretty low cost mini PC here and the game was a lot of fun to play with no noticeable issues. Again, around 40 to 45, sometimes 50 frames per second. And in space, this game was running at a solid 60. And this is Doom Eternal running at 1080p at the lowest settings. This one did very well also. We were getting about 45 to 60 frames per second, closer to 60 when you were in a more confined environment and closer to 45 when you were outdoors like you see here. One thing to note is that I had accidentally turned on the ray tracing features of the game and it actually worked on here at around 30 frames per second, sometimes in the high 20s, because this does have ray tracing cores built in, believe it or not, but it's not going to perform all that well when those settings are enabled in a game that supports it. One last game here is Ace Combat 7, and this is 1080p, and we were getting between 45 and 60 frames per second, but mostly 60 frames per second with high settings enabled. So some games you can push a little bit harder, and again, some games that you bring down to 720p will perform exceptionally well on this box with the Ryzen processor on board. And I also tried out some higher end emulation. Here we've got OutRun 2006, which is a PS2 game running on the PCSX2 emulator. I also bumped up its internal rendering resolution to 1080p. It looks and plays great here at full speed. It wasn't able to maintain 4K resolution, but 1080p here is playing just fine, and it certainly looks a little sharper than the original. One thing to note as you're watching these, you might see some tearing going on. That's because we are outputting 60 frames per second on the video capture hardware that I'm using, but only recording 
at 30. Let's take a look at a couple of benchmarks now. And on the 3D Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 2,671. This comes in pretty much with an identical score to what we got out of the ThinkPad Z16 Gen 1 that we looked at a few months ago. That, of course, is a much more expensive laptop than this cheap mini PC, but this little device certainly holds its own, and the seventh generation chip does a little better on the CPU test there. The graphics scores are about the same because they have similar graphics hardware built into that chip. Additionally, you'll note the Y730 gaming laptop on the list. I looked at this one a couple of years ago, but this keeps right up with a 1050 Ti based computer that you would have bought a couple of years ago, kind of at the low to mid range. And that's where this really falls in, about a 1050 Ti in its performance level. One thing though that it didn't do very well in my testing is VR. I ran one of the Steam VR benchmarks and this did not pass muster on that. So the 1050 will do better there. Um, but for a lot of other games that are playing on a screen, this will certainly hold its own, but I'm not going to recommend this one for virtual reality. But unfortunately, we didn't do so well on the 3D Mark stress test. There we got a failing grade of 77.6%. So if you're playing a game that is really pushing the hardware over a long period of time, you're going to see a bit of a performance reduction. I didn't notice anything when I was playing games on this, but that test I ran a couple of times just to be certain, and sure enough, it would drop off when that processor got a bit too hot under heavy load. So just bear that in mind if you were looking at this as a primary gaming device. But it does do Linux quite well. I booted up the most recent version of Ubuntu and everything loaded up quickly. I had all of the hardware recognized, including the audio, the Bluetooth, and the Wi-Fi, along with the video. And it was a very nice Linux experience. And because you have the option to load in two distinct storage devices on here, you could play around with a dual boot environment perhaps if you want, or even run a little server on it given how much RAM this thing has and the number of cores available to you on its eight core processor. So overall, I think this is a pretty good value, especially when you look at the amount of RAM and processing power you get for the price point. I was though disappointed that we kept failing that 3D Mark stress test. For all the noise the fan makes, I was hoping that it was doing a better job cooling this thing down. But unfortunately, you saw the results there and you will probably see a reduction in your gameplay performance over extended gaming sessions. I didn't notice it when I was playing with this, but clearly the results from that test indicate there will be some throttling going on. So be aware of that. We are getting in another one like this from a different manufacturer with similar specs that I will be reviewing in a couple of days. So stay on the lookout for that one. We'll see if there's some other options out there that might cool a little better. But still, if you find this one at a good price and you're looking for a nice performing secondary PC or a primary one to get work done, this is a good choice. It does perform quite well. One last thing I want to leave you with is that these no name brand PCs don't often come with the best long term support. These are kind of a buy at your own risk scenario, but the quality that I've seen out of this company, which has now sent me three different computers to look at, feels pretty nice, especially compared to some of the other generic brands I have looked at in the past. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Zybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht and I'm the Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.